Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Hey folks, this is Bruce Hutchin, host of Wait Till Rendezvous, and I'm heading up north of the border with a good friend, Christopher James. And Christopher had something on Instagram the other night about survival, and I went, we need to do a show about survival. So Christopher, thanks for coming on, and you and I have got a lot of experience about survival, Ooh. about being in the backcountry, about being places, just like in the country right now, I just watched the news down in Alabama, F4 was on the ground for a an hour and 16 minutes, you know, that's a long time, just incredible. And the destruction it does and cold and then just all the stuff that happened. So let's talk about the four corners of survival and we'll see where this thing goes. Absolutely. Bruce, first, I want to thank you, man. It's a third time's a charm being on this wonderful podcast of yours. So I'm really appreciative. You shot me a message there and giving me an opportunity to talk about this. I really, really appreciate it, man. And like Bruce kind of said, I mean, we have a lot of experience here in the back country. I'm from Alberta, up in Canada, so very similar to Colorado. We are buried in snow right now. We don't have a whole lot of greenery right now that we could really look at. But even in our little landlocked area for the first time, we had an earthquake yesterday, actually, a 4.6 in a spot that's never had them. So wow. I think our timing is critical right now when it comes to talking about just survival, whether it's urban or wilderness. I think it's very, very important. And I think talking about the core four, and I think that's something that, that everybody should have in their toolbox. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up suburban <clears throat> because all of a sudden the power goes out. What do you do? No, I know Absolutely. a lot of my friends are Mormon and they have their closet and they have yep. food, they have water, and they have whatever they need. They have it. Well, a lot of people don't have that. And so, so yeah. the power goes out. Things aren't going to go so well because there's a foot of snow outside or more, no power. What are you going to do in urban conditions? So let's talk about, start off right about urban, and then we'll go into back. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you kind of touched on it there with, with a lot of the people having a stockpile worth of food and, and other essentials. I mean, that's kind of more of a prepper community for sure. You're prepping for the worst or SHTF, that split of hits the fan sort of situation so you're kind of prepping for that and you can kind of see behind me there i got a little bit of, a, of an urban kit that i got going with flame starters that i can kind of do an interior kitchen or a burner sorry on but yeah food and water are critical i mean as long as you have candles you have a lighting source that isn't really a make or break a heat source is what's going to keep you going especially in the cold temperatures we see a lot of water main breaks where your water is shut down uh, what if utilities can't get out there? Are you prepared to uh, be able to go out there and either resource and source out different water? Food sources, make sure the things are canned or preserved properly. So be it salted or if you just go with a little soup, dry goods where you just add a little bit of heat and it puffs right up. What you kind of need to do in an urban survival scenario, especially if you're looking long term, is make sure that you have enough essentials that's going to last you. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit further the rule of three, but in urban, it's completely different in the fact that you have the access to the resources, but everything's going to be sort of weighed down. So I definitely recommend going to bargain and big bin stores, such as a Costco or something along those lines, and stocking up. So if you buy three cans of soup, buy a fourth and keep it in the basement. If you buy a couple bottles of water, so if you have a big cooler like a Culligan jug, or if you buy actual bottled waters, or even if you just run tap water, if you buy a big Culligan, get an extra, keep it in there. It's never going to spoil. If you buy flats of water, buy an extra one, keep it in your basement. If you just go tap water, fill up some of the old water bottles or Pepsi bottles that you have, keep them in the basement, keep yourself prepared so that if things do go south, you're ready to go. You need water. I should put it this way. You can go three days without water. So Absolutely. you got to figure out the taps off. Okay. Now, how much water do you have? How many people? And what's the standard that you should drink per day of water? Under regular conditions. So if you're not exerting yourself, if the heat isn't too crazy, if you're not hypothermic and shivering too much, the, on average, people really look at about a gallon of water per day. Okay. So 
you got a family of four, that's four gallons times, let's give it 10 days. Typically in an urban setting, five days, you're going to have the water back on or something worse wrong. But yeah, you'll have days. Well, that's 40 gallons of water. It is. That's a lot of water. If you really, really think about it, that's a tank of a small car. So you want to definitely make sure that you have the resources to really support that. So yeah, I mean, realistically, that's 4.4 liters. So for those of us in Canada, you got to buy four one liter bottles, very similar to this one, just for one day. Yeah. So folks, think about that because food, freeside food, <laughs> extra cans of soup. I mean, uh, you got your shelter. The heat goes out, then you got to do the sleeping bag thing, all huddled together. Close down the house as best you can and only stay in one room. I'm not a yeah. big proponent of propane heaters, constant basis. I think they're dangerous. Yeah. I really yeah. do, for the, for the most part. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of us that go out in the backcountry, we have generators as well, be it for our trailers or for our campsites or anything on those lines. So that's something else that you got to factor in. If you're going to run a power, you're going to run a generator, make sure that it's vented properly. But I'm with you as well with propane heaters. That releases a lot of contaminant into the air that you don't really want to be breathing in, especially if it's cold out and you can't open the windows. So definitely huddle together, bundle up the best that you can, run a bunch of candles. I don't know about you guys, but if you cook up a bunch of candles throughout the house, it's going to naturally warm up. So just make sure that you're kind of huddled together and, and running the best natural heat sources that you guys can. Yeah. So then people say, well, I live in a suburban setting. I'm not living in a cabin in Alaska or in the Rockies. I'm not self-sufficient already. So those yeah. type of people. But I'm talking about the person that, that goes into the mountains and they're going fishing, they're going hiking, they're going hunting. And how prepared should they be? I always say know your environment before you go into it. So do your research. So if you've never been into the Rockies, if you've never been into the Sierra Nevadas, if you've never been into these environments, do your research. We don't expect you guys to become experts in any situation, but definitely be familiar, especially with the climate. So whether you're walking topography maps, uh, you understand the sun and the solar lunar rotations, so you can kind of gauge things a little bit better. A strong working knowledge of the location, especially the route, I think would be the best bet. But above and beyond that, if you're not familiar with it, make sure that you have common knowledge on first aid. So if, for example, you go off the track or the wind blows or you get lost and you take a tumble or spill or anything could really happen out there, that you have the basic mindset and the knowledge behind you to really prepare and, and bandage yourself up the best you can so you can get off of that mountain or out of that climate or that environment before things get worse. That comes down to having, if you're going fishing, hiking, or hunting, if you're going into that environment where you normally don't go, that's why I have a day pack, that's why I have a fanny pack. And I've climbed the 14ers here in Colorado, and I'm just amazed what people don't have. And they're lacking now that, that 2 o'clock every afternoon, there's going to be either snow showers, thunderstorms, rain squalls, wind's going to come <laughs> up, something's going to change almost Absolutely. every single afternoon. And there's people in their shorts, in their t-shirts, and I'm going, okay, hypothermia, this or that. I mean, they're so exposed. Plus, up at 14,000 feet, you're exposed. There's no place to hide. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And as you get higher, we'll touch into this a little bit later when we talk a little bit more about the core four. But once you look at a mountainous range, and I've actually written an article about it, just for the fact that people climb these mountains and, and they are ill-prepared. They're, just because a trail is blazed doesn't mean you could be lazy against it. doesn't mean that you should do it in flip-flops. doesn't mean that you shouldn't bring trail poles. doesn't mean that you shouldn't bring a backpack, water, fanny pack, first aid kit doesn't mean you go in there just because millions of people have walked it before you could be that one so make sure that you always kind of have a basic idea so be it a blade a means of signal a fire first aid kit do what you got to do so that if things do go south a trail could get closed rain squall could kick up and a trail could wash out how are you going to get out of there if you're walking around in crocs so we want to make sure that people are definitely prepared and like i said especially in higher elevations food's a lot more scarce so Bring granola bars, bring a couple bags of nuts, mixed nuts, perishable things like, or non-perishable, sorry, like beef jerky. Bring little things like that that's going to be able to run you through. But yeah, with you, I see people going up there in their Lululemon pants and flip-flops, and they're astonished as to 
A, this is a long hike, and B, if things were to go sideways, what what would you do? And a lot of these people just don't have the answers. And and we're not expecting professionals. I mean, they hire those guys to go out there and find people with blinky lights, but definitely at least be a little bit somewhat prepared, especially for those of us, Bruce, who are in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains. We know what it's all about. We get those avalanche warnings left, right, and center. We see what goes on in these mountains, and it's not just the environment. It's the animals as well. So definitely uh, make yourself prepared. You know, the only um, situation that whitetail hunters, I'm not even going to talk about elk hunters, but just whitetail hunters, since that's a problem to my listeners, you start thinking about they're going to their 40, the farm's 200 yeah. acres, there might be some swamp, but they've been on the land forever. But yeah. I've got a good friend that had an accident with his tree stand and he lived, but hadn't been for his cell phone, which he was in a climber. The climber went upside down. He's hanging. The cell phone hit the ground, and the last call was dialed. So his wife heard of the whole right. struggle, and well, that's what he, saved he's lucky. His life. That's what saved his life. So the odds of all that happening aren't real good. So let's talk about. I'm not <laughs> talking about the safety harness and guide ropes and all that. Just basic safety of when you go into the woods. What happens if you turn your ankle? break your leg, and somehow your cell phone doesn't work. You can't call for help. Absolutely. What are we going to do? So the biggest thing is if you're laid out, you've got to remember the rule of three. Rules of three are paramount when it comes to it. And we're going to get into it a little bit more as far as getting your way out of it. But the human body on a normal, non-strenuous sort of situation could go three minutes without oxygen. They can go three days without water, three weeks without food. So you definitely want to remember those sort of rules. Now, again, that's under extenuating circumstances. If you're panicking, your oxygen stores are going to be severely depleted. If you're shivering or if it's a hotter climate, your water sources are going to be severely depleted. But it goes even further than that. So say your cell phone's broken or you don't have range or anything like that. The rule of three also applies in how to get yourself out. So if I'm trying to teach a wilderness survival course to a bunch of people or kids, the biggest thing that I try and tell them is if you're going to set a signal fire, set three. If you're going to set signal flags, set three. If you have a whistle, blow three times. If you have a boat horn, blast that horn three times. Beep, beep, beep. Three blasts of anything or three flashes, so if you have a signal mirror, is the international sign of distress. So if, for example, you have a signal mirror or you're burning a fire and somebody's flying over you with a helicopter and they see three flashes off a signal mirror or three plumes of smoke, dark, dark, dark smoke, or three flags, they're going to recognize that as somebody being in distress. So definitely recommend the rule of three across the board whenever you go into that situation. There I am. I twisted my ankle. I'm a mile off the road. So how do I take care of myself? Really it all depends on how bad the ankle is and what the resources are. So if we're talking whitetail hunting, whitetail hunting is primarily done within a transition. So you go from one sort of environment to another, be it from forest to field or field to swamp or forest to greenery, something along those lines, the bulk of whitetail hunting or any deer hunting is done within transition. When there's transition, that means that there are natural resources for you. By and large, I mean, we see it in Calgary. We don't routinely have deer walking through downtown Calgary. So you're more likely to be in a natural environment. So you will have sturdy sticks. You will have things along those lines that A, either prop you up and make a makeshift cane that you can support your weight, shuffle yourself out of there. You're able to have most likely take a belt off. Most people wear belts now. Take your belt off and strap on a stick on either side of your ankle, right? Make a makeshift splint, wrap it with your belt. Not too, too tight. It's not a tourniquet, but make sure that it's wrapped and supported. Just basic first aid of what you would do to get yourself out. If it progressively worked worse, if you have an open wound, then definitely you want to clean it the best that you can with a water pack, whether you have a camel pack on your back or a water bottle and make sure a, a tourniquet. So if you have to tear up a sleeve off your shirt, wrap it in nice and tight, just make yourself available. But by and large, all that is fine and good if you have no other resources and if you're ill-prepared. And we kind of touched on it. Bring a day pack, throw a first aid kit in there. Whether it's your fanny pack, throw a first aid kit in there. Most outdoor s- stores that are out there now have day packs or fanny packs that are built in as a first aid kit based on the environment that you're doing. So that'll have a hiker pack with a lot of the resources that you're going to need in a first aid scenario if you were to get injured as a hiker. They have a mountain hunter, so sheep, 
anything along those lines, high altitude sort of situation, be it rock climber, sheep hunt, they have high altitude first aid packs geared specifically for that. They're really inexpensive. And, you know, that could be ultimately what, what makes or breaks you figuratively yeah. and literally. For shelter, if you drive along highways and interstate, you see these big trash bags. I mean, they're huge, humongous, yeah. and they're heavy plastic. I have a friend, uh, Peter Karmerfeld, was a survival instructor for the Air Force for a long period of time. And he had a company called Outdoor Safe. And so he put together that garbage bag. And so you put that and make that into a poncho. You can slit it and make it into a tarp. Absolutely. So you, you create that shelter, you, a barrier between you yourself and the element. Then he had a magnesium fire starter with cotton balls and petroleum jelly. Great fire starter. Or oh, if you were, I would say it's a fantastic one. That or dryer lint, I carry it with me anywhere. Right. Anywhere and then, I go, it'll you know, an aspen bark, a great fire starter. And then, so you get fire. So what are the four things, the four corners that we're going to jump into and chat a little bit right now on? Sure. We've kind of touched on a lot of it. So the core four that I really look at as far as survival goes is shelter. It would be fire, food, and water. Everything else is sort of luxury at that point. If you're in a true survival scenario, as long as you hit those core four, you can make yourself out of it. So yeah, the heavy tarp, or not tarp, sorry, but the heavy garbage bags, again, relatively cheap. You can get a roll of 25 of them for three bucks, right? They don't take up really any space. They're not too, too heavy. Throw a couple in there. And yeah, it goes even further than that. You could use it to trap. If you bind it up, you'd actually make tarp or uh, traps out of it. You can use it to filter water. You can use it to collect water. Being out in the woods is not cheap to begin with. So if you're able to find cheaper means or even fashion a thing called bushcraft and you're able to make cups and everything on those lines in the woods or chopsticks or, or find means around that, it makes life a lot easier. But yeah, the core four would be shelter, food, water, and fire for sure. You know, you already know three weeks without food, three days without water. The first thing yeah. that I always do, if I know I'm going to stay out, it's just I'm not going to get back to camp for whatever reason. I killed an elk and right. It's just, it's not going to happen. So we're going to spend the night in the bush, which is really in the right situation. It's fun. The bad, wrong situation. Yeah. Weather, it it's sucks. uncomfortable. <laughs> and, Especially if you're going elk hunting. You're going fall. I mean, that can get cold really quickly at night. So it's not like you're doing a spring grouse hunt or anything on those lines. It gets cold. Yeah. But the biggest thing that I remember and taught this long, long time ago, underneath all the evergreens are the dead tinder, if you will start collecting nows and you have a huge pile not a little yeah. pile you have a huge pile then you go yeah. and start looking for logs and you probably don't have a chainsaw with you or a bow saw probably got a saw for your elk so you start getting logs and timber to make it through the night because the worst thing you want to do is for your fire to go out during the night because you're going to be sleeping by your fire in that small lean-to that you made with your garbage bag and <laughs> you're going to be fine Absolutely. You're going to have fire and you're going to have shelter. Now, the next thing is, okay, how much water did you bring? Okay, if it's snowing, then I forget the ratio. How much snow do I have to melt in order to get a gallon of water? There is a natural ratio there. I don't believe in it. A lot of it is definitely very different based on the snow itself. So they do say, and like I said, I don't really remember, but it should be quite a bit of snow because it melts down. Snow is about 70% air, right? So if you melt all that down, that's what you got to look at. So if you're going to collect snow, I'd recommend actually going for ice or packing it down a little bit more. But yeah, ultimately I'd recommend ice. A lot of the air has already been taken out of it. And that's why it is frozen. It is pure water. You'll get a lot more yield of water if you were to go look at that versus snow alone. But snow, again, it really all depends on if it's a heavy snow, if it's a lighter, fluffier snow, the ratio is there, but it is something that I kind of take with a grain of salt, personally. So water, you really need three days of water. Doing a gallon, that's three gallons. Well, I don't know a lot of people that carry three gallons, but I carry a water filter or a straw. Yep. You know, Absolutely. And so I, all I have to do is find water. Typically, without too much work, you can find water in the mountains. Oh, yeah, quite easily. I mean, you kind of touched on it there. So for myself, I carry this life straw and I have a few of these. Again, they're relatively inexpensive, but it's just a little 
feeder tube there. You put that in your water and you sip and it actually filters it all in up to a thousand liters. So again, this is lightweight. You could throw that in your pack. It doesn't take up any space. It comes with a tether. You can tie it onto your backpack or your rucksack and you'll be good to go. But yeah, hundred percent. But if you don't have those sort of things, but you've already made a fire, you can make a charcoal filter quite easily with just debris, even your heavy bag. And we're getting the bushcraft and survival yeah. skills that isn't the the mention the topic of the show. It's just making yeah. people become become aware. I know when I was going in the wilderness, one I either would have topo map when Google Earth came on, I would actually fly places in British Columbia or Alaska or whatever, and I would fly where I knew I was going to be. So yeah. when I got yeah. up there and got with my guide. I say, well, we're going to do this and that. He looked at me and go, how do you know where we're going? I said, well, I've already been there because I want to know yeah. my outs. If I'm going Absolutely. someplace, if that guy dies, one, yeah. I can ride a horse and the horse knows where the food is. The horse is going to take me home. <clears throat> you got to trust yeah. your horse. They'll, they'll absolutely. absolutely do that. And yeah. they'll get you to a, a safe place because they don't want to be cold and wet and they're hungry and they know where the food is. So one, trust your Absolutely. Two, your guide dies, then you got to take all your resources and set up and say, I'm going to be here for a while, even though you're not going to be I'm going to be here for yeah. a while. And then you get yourself together and say, okay, this is not a good situation, but I'm going to get out of here. And the biggest thing that my friend Peter told me, he says, my mental capacity, my mental framework, my mental blueprint, if you will, of where I'm at right now. One, I'm going to survive this. I'm not going to wig Absolutely. out and cry. Okay, there's a time for that. And you go, holy, I'm in deep doo-doo, and this is not yeah. good. And 15, 20 miles from where I know a road is, the closest road, and I don't know how close the nearest person is, but I can make Absolutely. it out. Especially in northern British Columbia or Alaska, I mean, you don't know where anybody is at any given time. So absolutely, I mean, trust your horse for sure. But survival is mental. And that is something that I tell people all the way through. If you panic, game over. If you keep yourself calm and you keep yourself collected, like Bruce said, I mean, there is a time to go, oh, no, right? This is not going to work out in my best interest. But take a couple, a few deep breaths. Compose yourself. Take three minutes and just assess the situation. So there's an old adage in military slang. It's the ODA loop, O-O-D-A. Assess, orient, decide, and act, right? And that's kind of what you need to do is observe the situation, sorry. So observe, orient, decide, and act is to assess and observe sort of what you're up against. Orient yourself, whether it be along water or anything along those lines. And again, like we're not going to touch base on deep-rooted discussions on that, I mean, if you guys are interested, reach out to me directly or reach out to Bruce and he'll get you in touch to reach out with me if you want to learn more. Decide your next plan of action and then act on it. But if you kind of keep your wits about you, staying still in one situation is maybe not always the best bet. Leave trace, but it, staying there could actually be more detrimental. But yeah, I mean, you pretty much nailed it. It just, it is mental. You're going to be at the core of the elements. You might not see any animals. You might not see anything that could really assess you harm, but it's the mental fortitude. You're alone. It's dark. It's quiet. You're hearing noises that you don't know what they are. Is it a bear or is it just a squirrel running across a tree? It is very much a mental game for sure. And if you're able to overcome that, kind of like what we discussed earlier, strength and struggle, if you're able to sort of accept the situation that you're in, you'll make it through. I forget to mention one other thing. Always let somebody know where you're going. I don't care if you're going to the same tree stand you've hunted for the last 20 years. Okay, just send somebody a text. Hey, I'm going to be at the concussion stand. I'm, being, I'm going to be hunting the, the saddle. I'm hunting the old yeah. oak, whatever, because everybody knows exactly where that is and see you tonight or I'll call you Absolutely. when I get a big buck down. But let somebody know. And today's with all the social media and all the technology you have, there's no reason that you don't let somebody know, hey, I'm going to the woods. I'm doing a short hunt. I'm going to be in my train for a couple hours. See you tonight. Absolutely. And that's the nice thing that you kind of touched on is with social media. Every modern phone, you're able to send real-time locations, right? So for myself, for example, if I'm going into the woods or something along those lines, 
I will send a ping off my iPhone when I know I have radio frequency. So I'll still sit in my truck and I'll send a ping. Hey, I am here. This is where my truck is. So that if things don't come back, and like you said, yeah, I'll be back in four hours. If I'm not back in four hours, they're able to bring that up on their map, come right to there, and then that's a great starting point. But if you just say, hey, I'm going to the woods, you're as good as gone. It's a needle in the haystack at that point for the people that are coming to look for you, unless they're familiar with your hunting patterns or your fishing patterns or your hiking patterns. But yeah, I'll always send a ping. So I'll say, hey, I'm going out. I'll be gone from this point to this point. Here's my location. So then at least if something does go south, they know exactly where I'm at. Right. And when I go in the backcountry, I hunt in drainages. I mean, because that's how you get in, that's how you get out. And so I said, I'm going to hunt Crazy Creek, and then I'm going to drop into Big Bend, and I'm coming out Expo. I should be out in three days. Absolutely, yeah. And And so they know, okay, it's the fourth day. Let's start at Expo, go up that, cross over into Big Bend, and then drop into where we started. So they know specifically where I'm at in thousands, if not millions of acres they've got a starting point. Exactly. And I mean, and it even goes further than that. So yeah, you could say, Hey, I'm dropping into crazy Creek expo into big Ben. That's great. But leave some trail markers and leave something simple that people are to do, whether it's just snapping a stick or pin and tape or something along those lines to a tree, give people an idea to kind of say, Hey, Chris went this way. Hey, Bruce went this way. Here's a bunch of trees that are snapped or rocks that are pointed in an arrow or something along those lines. Give yourself the best chance to get out of there or have people come find you to get out of there. Folks, if you have any questions, you can reach me at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. Chris, how can he reach out to you? Uh, They can reach out to me at blioutdoors at gmail.com or on Facebook and Instagram. Both of them are just blioutdoors, B-E-A-L-I-O-N, outdoors, both of them. So folks, I'd like to hear some input from you because like I said, I'm repeating myself, but hellacious weather in the country. And we got more. We got another storm coming. We got heavy winds coming. I hunt where there's a lot of beetle bark because the elk like it because there's no cover. The sun is on the ground for the first time in 20 years. And a lot of trees have died, but they snap off because they're dead. And the high wind comes up and every year we'll find a deer, an elk, could be a moose that just got hammered, just got his skull crushed. Because a, a timber came down. Well, if they can get killed, then the odds are mathematically against ever that happening. But it still can happen. And so two things, if you're in a burned area or a beetle bark area, if high wind comes up, get the heck out of there. Just oh, yeah. drop down and get the heck out of that area. And don't even think about it because it's too dangerous. When those things start flying, you have no idea where they're going to go. Absolutely. And a lot of the wind, actually, so if it dries out, for example, in an arid condition, once that wind kicks up and you're in a dry environment, especially in a burn area, it could start a fire very, very quickly. You could reignite charcoal or old burnt timbers or something along those lines. Even just dry wood, the wind itself could actually start a flame. So like Bruce said, I mean, if that wind kicks up, get out of there. You don't want timber actually catching on you and falling on you or just burning itself. Give yourself the best chance. Yeah. So, folks, I don't know what other questions you have. Chris, what else would you like to add or before we close this off? Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, the biggest thing is just be prepared. Know your environment. Even if you're not familiar with topo maps or anything on those lines or basic navigation, there's a lot of apps out there that you could use offline that are maps. So a lot of backcountry apps that you can kind of get work offline as far as mapping goes. It's not going to give you a true GPS coordinate. Some do, Absolutely. But you could rely on those once you're in the bush. You could say, okay, I started here, got out here, pull out an old map. I'm a bit old school. I pull out a map and an old compass and say, okay, this is what's going on. Or, I mean, I just put a stick in the ground and watch the sun and see what happens as far as direction goes. Just be prepared and be confident. Remember the rules of three. If you want to get into it deeper, reach out to me. I'm happy to help you. That's what I'm here for. The biggest thing is be calm, be cool, be collected, and be safe. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to this segment of Whitetail Rendezvous. And so people are going to start getting in, getting out, and uh, doing some things. And one thing that we just had on the news, we've had numerous avalanches this year already. So this show will be going up sometime this, this month in March. So just really be smart. That's a whole different kettle of fish to discuss. But be smart out there. 
and don't push the envelope because there's always tomorrow. Yeah, nature wins 100% of the time. So just make sure that, that, like Bruce said, be smart. If this is something that you guys are interested in continuing to hear, reach out to Bruce. I'd be happy to come back and talk to him. This is my third time hanging out with him and Whitetail Rendezvous, and I'm definitely honored, and I want to continue helping that out and helping his great brand and, and helping him grow, but help keep you guys all prepared as well. So if it's something you're interested in, reach out to Bruce, let him know, say, hey, bring that lion guy back, and I'll be happy to set it up. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.